you just started to touch on this kind of on the generative AI stack. I don't know if you can like talk us through the layers. Yeah, sure. So when you look at the top of that hyper stack, we, we spent a fair amount of time just unpacking how we thought through every element of what it would take to be able to build a generative AI capability, right? And so we, of course, spend a lot of time really understanding what these foundation models were, and that's kind of layer one, right? Really just be able to provide the perception around images, video, audio, acoustic waveforms, like all the multimodalities that are going to and continue to emerge, particularly when it comes to the transformer-based architecture and specifically around not only LMs, but also latent diffusion models and other areas where we're seeing more than just uh, the application of transformers back into text. And so that's for us the layer one as we think about from a foundation model standpoint. Mm -hmm. The layer two is where I spent a fair amount of time in this discussion. What we believe is the need to deliver a domain specific set of models for an industry, for a vertical, for a horizontal. One of the favorite examples of a domain specific model that just emerged, I want to say two and a half, three weeks ago, was the Bloomberg. Bloomberg GPT. GPT, yeah. right? Fascinating, right? That like Bloomberg has all of this incredible financial reporting data, and now they've trained a model at scale to be able to deliver that into a deep summarization, deep articulation, deep generation capability set um, off of their own domain specific model. We're gonna see a lot more of those. Um, we're gonna see that for all kinds of use cases. There's no reason why a US torts law model wouldn't emerge, right? right? There isn't a reason why a uh, global tax law you know, model would emerge. I think there's a lot of discussion about sort of regulation, particularly around these models. I'm actually very excited to see some of the regulation because honestly, I believe there's a moment where some of these regulated industries can have very finely tuned, focused domain specific models that are regulated for the needs of that industry like healthcare or financial services. So that's layer two. Mm -hmm. Layer three is the tools themselves, right? And we talked a lot about the tools that are emerging. Most of them are predominantly defined by the machine learning operations tools, the MLOps tools. Some of those tools are now being targeted and focused on MLOps. And layer four is the, the delivery of those applications, the, the Jaspers, the hour ones, the deep dubs. These are applied, full functioning applications that are being delivered. So my partners and I, Lonnie Jaffe, mm -hmm. Kanesh Bell, Nikhil Sachadev, and some of our, our team members and associates, Jenna Zerker and Sunny Singh, put together a, um, a view of where this uh, next stack will go. And that's, um, of course, what you referred to. And anything you want to dig in into that conversation, we're happy to have that here as well as um, as well as online for anyone who's interested in really just digging in with us. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to just generally kind of think how how this generative AI stack, uh, how will it unlock new things? Like, what are you most excited about? This, where is this going to go? Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. So we talked a lot about what what has been applied up to this moment. Now let's let's think about where the unlocks are going to occur that we haven't quite seen yet, right? And so whether Insight or another venture capital firm invests into these opportunities, we're, we're profoundly excited to see what's coming next. Imagine what computational generative architecture could look like, right? So if we're building a skyscraper now, instead of using a traditional CAD CAM piece of software, mm -hmm. we generally give an input to say, mm -hmm. build me a 35 floor skyscraper with 10 apartments that are 800 to 1200 square feet in size, mm -hmm. 10 exits on each floor that has a floor plate of 25,000 square feet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we have the technology now to be able to do that at mm -hmm. scale. Another great example that I've more recently seen is if you look at the entirety of the code base that's been delivered across many enterprises today, 
there's actually a lot of sloppiness in terms of testing and scaffolding. Well, what if you can actually take a generative model and rescaffold and create all the unit tests necessary mm -hmm. to invert what we understand in what's been compiled or declaratively written in the source code? And suddenly you have a much better test bed of testable code as you've now brought it to market. It certainly um, don't have to talk about where you know Copilot has gone already, right? I mean that that's certainly a use case today. Like you talk to any five, ten x developer today, they'll talk about the the exponential amount of productivity that they're getting in their own in their own work lives. So I keep looking at these opportunities, and I see more things to to do, more things to create, more things to revolutionize, and that's what keeps me. Um, you know, glued to this, the seat of my, you know, the seat of this, this sort of innovation that's happening and excited by it because it's the next generation of founders and entrepreneurs that are doing this. It actually turns out it's also a fair number of incumbents. That's like the thing that's, that I've seen that's more exciting than any other wave mm -hmm. of innovation before. Mm -hmm. Like every other wave of innovation before was, was, was up to the, the big tech firms. Well, it was it was up to you know uh, innovators to come in, smaller folks, and sort of get the the ball moving. Right? right here, you're absolutely right. It's the big tech firms can simultaneously innovate. The the incumbents can simultaneously innovate just as much as as the startups can. So it's um it's a moment where I I, I really think it comes down to what are these key personas in software. Can you build a UX, a workflow, a private data set, and a very finely tuned generative model around that private data set mm -hmm. to own the persona? Mm -hmm. Like I almost feel like it's a market where a thousand personas will have a thousand different right. related right. interplaying stacks, mm -hmm. particularly when it comes to, to the LLM layer and the private data layer. Yeah, there's a huge amount of opportunity, an unprecedented amount of opportunity, uh, you know, for people <laughs> who are listening who haven't been in data science for a while, you're getting into it at the, at the right time. And for people like me, and probably like you who've been in this space for a while, this is, is so exciting because like you say, it's like, okay, let's find a niche, let's find a problem. Like you said, like going back to the Jasper thing, we're kind of using them as our like general example to keep returning to, but it's a great one to say, content marketers should have better tools. And then we say, okay, well, how can we do that? And so you can do that for, as you say, a thousand different niches, maybe more. Um, and you know, there might be market-specific things like, okay, you know, this content marketing tool works really well um, in Western markets or something. But you're like, we're going to need something really specific for Indonesia. Yep. Um, and so there's yeah, a, a tremendous amount of opportunity. It's really exciting. Let, let me give you another example of uh, what a continuous journey looks like in in a software market. So. You probably have heard a lot about where BPO, business process outsourcing, was for many, many years. And then you saw the introduction of robotic process automation, RPA solutions, right? Whether that be Blue Prism or UiPath or Automation Anywhere. What we're seeing now is some of those incumbents, but also some incredible upstarts start to build almost a more intelligent process automation layer. Like, so some inside companies like Bardeen or Workado, what they're enabling us to now do is instead of hard coding all of the, the declarative logic, instead of hard coding the rules surrounding this, instead mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. finding all of the, the, the nooks and crannies of where you put fuzzy logic into your software, well, guess what? Replace that with a generative model yep. that you can continuously train. Mm -hmm. So that, that I find you know, incredibly exciting when even in, massively well understood existing software categories are now going to be reimagined again, mm -hmm. uh, even by both the incumbent and the upstarts. Yeah, and something that we talked about before recording, another place where models like particularly GPT-4 has absolutely blown my mind is with labeling data. Yep. So previously, I would think of, or a data scientist on my team would think of an amazing model, but we're like, man, it's gonna be hard to make those labels. Like even if we think about, okay, yeah, like we can farm out the creation of those labels, but we're not confident that they're gonna do a great job. It's, it's a complex task that we're asking here. And 
um, without going into the details of some of these use cases at, at our company, um, I when GPT-4 came out, the same prompt that I tried so hard to get GPT-3.5 to do, with GPT-4, I remember just throwing in something where I was like, this is too vague. Like I was in a meeting. Mm. And so I was like, I don't want to really get this prompt right. I'm just going to quickly throw something at it. See what happens. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, I'm probably not defining the problem well yeah. enough. And it came back with exactly what I was looking for, perfectly executed. Brilliant. And so, yeah, that's another opportunity for our listeners is if there's, you can create now tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of labels uh, in the amount of time that previously it might have taken you laboriously to create a hundred labels. Yeah. Well, it's funny you mentioned this this idea of I talked about automation. You talked about labeling. It also kind of pushes the extension of how we think about um, continuously running models, right? And now there's a, an entire line of work that's happening. I don't know if you saw uh, Auto GPT or Baby AGI, right? And what these models are really now doing is just constantly running and finding iteration on the objective function that they're going after. It's not quite certain how far we should let these go uh, for, uh, for the reasons yeah. uh, that we can, of course, get into at any moment. But at the same time, it just kind of gives us an idea of how much more sort of manual work can be reimagined and up-leveled mm -hmm. with the use of a generative model as yeah. well. 